In this chapter, we're talking about public goods. And again, my dissertation is somewhat on, was on quasi-public goods, which means a, a good that has both public good characteristics and private good characteristics. So forgive me if I get a little too excited about this pretty short chapter. Um, and forgive me if I keep talking about a dissertation I did long ago and I don't know, it just, I, I still find this topic incredibly interesting. So, um, probably the best way to start talking about this would be to remind ourselves of what um, the public good is. So, um, let's actually just go to, I'm just going to skip ahead here to four. We think of goods as having two kinds of characteristics. They are either rival or non-rival, and they're either excludable or non-excludable. And where you fall in those categories determines whether we're talking about a private good, a public good, or <laughs> I guess what I would call a quasi-public good, <laughs> what the textbook here calls an impure public good. Oh, it sounds a little churchy to me, but um, an impure public good. Uh, let's talk about these. So what does it mean to be rival? To be rival means that my use reduces or prevents your use. To be excludable means that I can set up mechanisms whereby if you don't pay for it, you don't get it. Public goods, by their definition, are both non-rival and non-excludable, meaning that consumption doesn't reduce someone else's and I can't stop someone from being able to consume it. So examples being the police department, fire department, national defense are perfect examples of public goods because the whole nature of protecting is that you can't exclude individuals. And if someone doesn't pay for it, they still get protected. And just because you're protected doesn't reduce the protection of others. Um, an impure public good, or what, again, what I would call a quasi-public good, if you're looking it up on the internet and Googling around, I would call it a quasi-public good. These would be goods that, um, well, the, the textbook here says satisfy both of these conditions, but not fully. Eh, that's a horrible definition. If I could rewrite this um, textbook, um, I would change most of their discussion of the quasi-public good. I don't know if it's just because this is more my field, uh, maybe than Gruber's field, definitely. Um, it, it, it is binary. It, it's, not, um, it's not a spectrum here. So he seems to be understanding it in terms of a spectrum. I actually still adhere to the belief that we're talking about binary conditions. It's either rival or non-rival. Not, eh, kind of, sort of. And that's what he's allowing here. Um, so quasi-public goods, from my definition, the Scheiding definition, would mean that it is excludable, but it's non-rival. Or it's non-rival, but it is excludable. Um, and those are goods where it's much more difficult to figure out how to pay for it. Um, What would the examples of that be? Um, examples of a quasi-public good, um, well, there's the one that I dealt with, which was scholarly journal publishing. But another kind of quasi-public good would be something like uh, television. And so what emerges in like television, but also emerges in scholarly journals, is that there's no, um, there's no definitive way there's no solitary way in which to pay for it so you have to come up with different schemes so for example the british they do have private television stations but the big thing is the bbc and the bbc doesn't have commercials but what they have is they have a television license every person who owns a tv has to pay an annual license fee and that gets them um, enjoyment of the goods in the united states yeah, we have public television, but that's not a big thing, right? We have ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, and they run commercials to pay the bills. Two different methods. And so here, again, I wouldn't call this impure. I wouldn't call it impure. I would call it quasi.
token TV. Yes. Yeah, and then the other option would be again like a crowded city sidewalk. You don't see this too often though. I, most of the quasi public good discussions occur in this element here. So the question when we're dealing at least with pure public goods is how many, um, you know, how much to provide. We're not going to get any information from the market. So, you know, we're all over the fence. We don't know how much national defense to provide, but also probably closer to home. Do you have a paid fire department or do you have a volunteer fire department? Um, do you have a volunteer police force or do you have a paid police force? Even for national defense as a country, how much do we protect? Like how much do we spend on those kinds of things? Um, we don't really know. There's no real clear cut way of to know when to transition. The only thing we could try to do is we could try to create some um, numerics of what we think the marginal costs are and the marginal benefits are to different things. But even these statistics, these comparisons, which you should be somewhat familiar with from uh, intermediate microeconomics, uh, it's all over the board in terms of what the cost coverage um, is going to be. But the idea here is that um, we would need to add up all the individuals to get a social demand curve and then we would get our social marginal benefit as the slope of that uh, demand curve. And then we compare that to our supply curve, which is our social marginal cost. <clears throat> um, what we end up having to do though as well is we need to get into kind of the deeper discussion then of um, what other costs are involved with producing this item and are we going to make individuals um, have most of it covered by taxes and then just a, part, a portion by a subscription so for instance right if an ambulance picks you up it's usually sent out by the fire department which we all pay for through our taxes yet the ambulance also sends a bill to our insurance company for the drive right so coming up with that scheme as opposed to something else that's all dependent upon what we estimate the marginal um, um, the marginal benefits to be and our marginal costs. And we kind of see this here. That again, we sum up individuals and how much they demand certain things to get our social demand curve. But again, this is pretty tough to do. It's not I, mean, I spent most of my time, even in my dissertation, trying to, this is just for public goods, for quasi-public goods, you do much the same process, but you still have this difficulty. In my case, how do you value what academics, what scholars, um, how much they benefit, what the value they place on the benefit they're reading to research of others? It's pretty tough. But the whole idea that we're trying to avoid here is you don't want just private companies doing it. Because the thing that we know is that if private companies do it, that they're not going to produce enough. And you're going to have the problem of people not paying for it, the free rider problem. Um, right? What gives an incentive for a library to subscribe to a journal when the people can just find stuff on the web for free, um, thus negating why the library subscribed to it in the first place. Um, or why should I get, why should I help pay for the fire department if I know that the fire department is still going to come and take out the fire of my house because it's, it spreads to other houses. There's an incentive for them to fight the fire, even if I pay or not. So we don't want to privately provide it. The problem we see in, for instance, in um, television in the United States is that television stations, um, they produce enough content, but the content they provide is not very good. So the one alternative was public television, which is 
partially funded by the federal government through PBS to provide the kinds of programs that kids would watch and you know other adults would watch where they learn something. But then what they also did is they created, this is kind of interesting here, they created um, this kind of interesting program here. Let me try to, no, let's see here. Sorry, I'll just go here. So the, Television stations, let's get rid of these from the last lecture. So we have these, what are called EI rules, which are regulations where the federal government said that if you're gonna have a, uh, a TV station, you have to have a certain portion of your programming educating children. Dude, it doesn't work um, because the rules about what qualifies as EI are pretty lax. Um, I mean, I, I, because I, I'm aware of these kinds of things and, and, you know, look at these kinds of things. So my kids, you know, they watch a lot of TV. I don't really limit them in watching TV. But the TV show Saved by the Bell qualifies as EI. Dude, if you've seen Saved by the Bell, it had like Zach and Kelly and, oh well, yeah, it's Screech, Dustin Diamond. Anyway, this qualifies as EI. I don't know why it, it shouldn't. Uh, I'm not even sure where I'm not even seeing why anyone else is complaining about it. Um, but it's pretty bad. Um, I'm not sure how people are learning. Uh, children are learning by Saved by the Bell. Um, I don't think they are. So these regulations are, are pretty bad. OK, and so we can kind of see some of these. I don't usually look at the applications, but let's just look at them here very briefly. Um, the, in Victoria, Australia, what they did was they put a tax on insurance policies and that tax paid for the fire services. You didn't get services if you didn't pay, um, you know, you, sorry, you would have, if you did not have insurance, you wouldn't be paying the tax, but you still got the services. Um, then with that realization that if you didn't have insurance, which, you know, sometimes if you're very, very rich or you're very, very poor, you don't get the insurance to remove that free rider problem. They just went to property taxes, which everyone pays. This is the primary way that most of us all pay for fire protection is through property taxes. Um, the Met, if you've ever been to the Metropolitan Museum of the Art, I have um, there, you're supposed to give a donation um, not a lot of people make the donation, um, 17%, um, are paying the, um, full charge, at least when they had, um, a donation instead of an admission fee. So they obviously weren't getting enough money, right? In this case, 83% were free riders. So to, to change that, you now have to show your driver's license. Dropbox being another one. Um, people weren't paying. I mean, I still have a Dropbox account, but I, I don't pay for it and it's old and um, they limited how much now I can even upload to it. Um, some people are paying, most are not. Um, as a different example, for Google, for instance, we have obviously a free amount that we can upload. I actually pay more for it, so I'm no longer a free rider, uh, just because I use it so much more. Typically, what we see in situations are ones where um, free riders don't usually destroy the entire public good, but they certainly limit it. And then you spend a lot of time trying to um, stop free riding, trying to enforce in different kinds of ways. And it just becomes problematic, right? I mean, um, you can kick someone out for not paying property taxes, but it's a pretty lengthy process. You can, um, you know, stop people from using the library if they don't have a driver's license, but that seems quite cruel. Um, 
and you know the whole goal of a library is not to exclude people so with all of these things um you know you kind of have to weigh the balance of is it worth it to try to control the free rider problem okay i'm gonna skip this the business improvement districts um i'm generally not a fan of them um Uh, I guess Gruber is, but I don't know. I feel like I should because he, the author, and I disagree. And I feel like one of the values, of, at least, of taking a class with anyone is that you should hear these disagreements. I'm not generally a fan myself of a business improvement district because I think that the free market works well enough for businesses to be incentivized to improve their surroundings. The problem with a city designating an area as a business improvement district, from my perspective, is that then the city is picking the winners and losers by designating a district, and then the businesses in that district then benefit from that designation. Times Square. So, I, yeah, dude, I was in Times Square in the 80s, and it was really, really dangerous, really dangerous. And then when I went there in the 90s, it obviously had improved quite a bit and it's really safe and it's more of like a carnival than anything. Um, so yes, you can look at them this slide and where you see crime is reduced, areas cleaner, business and tourism are booming. Yes, all of these things are happening. That is the success. The problem, as I see it, that's not being mentioned here is again, that the city is now picking the big companies that all can afford to be in this business improvement district as the winners, and then everyone else does not win. Um, continuing on here, then. Um, you know, what are the costs, I guess, or how difficult is it in general to try to remove um, the free rider problem when we have private provision? It's pretty easy. Um, because again, you can, um, you know, go through the courts and whatnot to try to enforce pricing. And then we get this other thing. I mean, there was this movement, this altruistic movement. Um, and, um, uh, Sam Bankman Freed, uh, the guy who did FTX was in this kind of belief system where they had markets, he, you know, he's creating crypto to generate all these profits that he then said would he would give to charities and whatnot. So it would create this kind of altruistic capitalism. Um, so to be altruistic, what does that mean? It means that you're um, valuing what others appreciate. Um, and that you could use the profit motive, the people, the motive that people want to make extra money to then be able to designate where you wanted that benefit to go to. So to act, um, if we go here, just because I don't want to. Effective, that's what it was called, effective altruism. Um, <laughs> well, it looks like, it looks like uh, Bloomberg doesn't like it. Uh, who else is Dustin Moskowitz, uh, Elon Musk. It's <laughs> uh, a pretty, uh, that's a nice way to say it. It's controversial. Okay, let me pause here. So yeah, effective altruism it seems hopefully to have been a fad I'm guessing here. But the idea here was that can we do things outside of the government being involved to do these things and that people can just earn profits and then donate those profits to the causes that we need, you know, to get things done in our society. Um, it's, a, it's a lot of work to try to replace government. Again, this goes into this whole idea of the politics of this all where Right. I mean, no one likes to think that they're under the thumb of the government and you want to remove the government because you don't want to seem like you're being restricted in those kinds of ways. 
on the other hand, it's kind of necessary. Um, and you get this kind of like warm glow. So the whole idea of the warm glow is why are you doing it? Why are you trying to be such a good person? Um, it might make you feel good. But aren't you just then privatizing, you know, I don't know, is there something wrong with doing something? If doing it makes you feel good, is it any less, are you being any less of a good person? Dude, that's for the real, that's for the philosophers to figure out, not me. I'm just an economist. Okay, I'm going to skip the learning by doing. I am of the firm belief that for the most part, we do need to have government involvement. It's just that we can figure out different ways to make it um, uh, sensitive to market forces. We know we can't have the private market do it because if the private market were left to itself, it would underprovide the product. Um, governments don't have to worry about the free riders. So can we combine the two? Can we get the force of the government and the lack of free riders that come with it, combine it with market forces? Well, you can try to. Um, we you know, can create, for instance, in my case here, we can create um, government websites that have research. Um, we can obviously give more money to public television to do things. Um, what we have to be concerned about, though, is that as the government gets more involved in these things, it does also crowd out what little public, what little private supply of the product that there was. So, interestingly, um, where wildfires are prevalent on the West Coast, like California, there's obviously fire departments, but if you have insurance, the insurance companies also will be like, oh my God, there's a big fire coming and it's gonna hit you know, these insured houses that we have. We are gonna hire our own private fire force to put out that fire. Now, to the extent then that the wildfire happens and then the public government says, you know, we're gonna spend more on fire protection, it'll start to crowd out that private provision of firefighting services, which does serve a role. Now, this third bullet point is true. It's not generally speaking that we'll see an incomplete crowding out. What we tend to see is a partial crowding out. Um, if the library buys more DVDs, then people stop buying DVDs, although who buys DVDs these days? Um, but the whole idea is, you know, libraries provide a lot of services and to the extent that they provide those services to others, then the private good will start to disappear. Um, and again, what we see is this whole idea that the government generally is going to pay for it out of taxes, but we could also see it where you have to pay money to the government to provide those things. Um, it'd be like a toll road, for instance. So some toll roads are owned by the government and you pay a toll road, you pay a toll to ride on the toll road for that um, period of time. Um, and you don't see these too often though. So what's the evidence suggest? At least the most of the suggest, uh, most of the evidence suggests is that there is, I'd say a fair amount of crowding out, not complete, but there is a fair amount of it. And so that's generally speaking why private companies are against the government doing most things. Um, you know, uh, we see this with, like, with energy efficiency, but we also see this even with Wi-Fi. So this big thing with Wi-Fi and, and people having access to um, internet. Internet's one of those rare utilities that's regulated by the government, but for the most part, a private company is providing it and not as many regulations as electricity or natural gas. So there's been this whole debate about, should we make internet, should we consider it to be just as important as electric and water? And maybe should the government provide it like they do 
like the water supply. Who would be against it? The phone companies and the cable companies that provide us internet because it would crowd them out. Um, you're probably not going to see it too often here. So let's look at some of the, the evidence here. We have a, a really old study here, about 30 years old here. The Kingma study did look at public radio. And so what you saw here is that, you know, for every, for as we start to fund public radio more through taxation, through government funding, then private contributions start to fall. Eh, I mean, it's always, it's always chronically underfunded um, how much money um, public radio and public television gets. Um, you can do some lab experiments as well. These lab experiments, yeah, they seem more convincing, but they're actually not that. I really actually don't want to spend time on it. Um, here's the challenge. The challenge all comes down to how do you mix these things properly? You know, when do we decide that it's going to be privately provided? When do we decide that the public is going to provide it? How do we decide between the two? Um, it's difficult, um, and it's a bit of an art more than it is a science. Um, and again, it comes, you know, we're having this debate right now. We have this debate, for instance, with healthcare. When we talked about things like Medicare for all. And we obviously didn't go with it, so we ended up just keeping things with the private sector. But if you think of how different um, the Bernie Sanders option was, that was a Medicare for all. Healthcare is a public good. We didn't do that, even with uh, the Affordable Care Act and Obamacare, despite what others tell you. Uh, the government really didn't take over healthcare. They just um, are paying more for it by providing subsidies for people to buy private healthcare insurance policies that do have a few more regulations applied to it. But for the most part, private insurance companies can still set rates as they want to. Ah, but interestingly, they can actually charge you more for health insurance if you smoke, going back to our previous chapter of the externalities. Okay, I'm going to skip our application here. And again, I'm skipping the applications for the most part just to kind of highlight the theory here as, as you're reading along in the book. When we're making this decision, again, about how public goods are going to be provided, what the public good provision is going to be, Again, we have to talk about what are those, we have to compare those benefits and costs to each other. Um, it's difficult to do. Um, obviously, if the government does it, you've got government workers that are building the highway or they're contracting it out to a private company to, to build those things. But on the other hand, right, we're talking about the maintenance of the item um, over time. And it becomes difficult. Like, so for instance, even here at the university, here for the University of Hawaii, we're building dorms, but actually, interestingly enough, it's not the state that's building the dorm. We're actually, a private company is building the dorm. We're just giving them the land and a share of the money. Um, so it, what's interesting about these times in terms of public provisions of goods, and what I actually think is, is nice about the current moments in time, is that it's becoming less binary. Things are becoming a bit more quasi. And we're saying that we can come up with different funding mechanisms such that the agility of the private sector can be involved. Like this dorm that they built got built in less than a year. The state could have never built it in less than a year. They wouldn't have been able to come up with the money. It would have taken forever. They built it really fast. Um, and so now probably a lot of our buildings are going to be probably built that way. Um, but again, what these two slides here, slides 35 and 36, just identify for us here is that the benefits and costs are difficult to, to compare here. And then um, finally, we just have to look at, you know, how do we measure what people want as their public goods? You know, what are they revealing to us? Um, are they valuing things properly? This has been the interesting thing that we'll start to pick up in the next chapter because we're having this debate now about what, or not now, but about 10 years ago, about what healthcare would be. Is healthcare a public good or not? That was essentially what the 20, 
2012 election was about. That's what the 2016 election was about. And even the, um, the 2008 election was about, right? When Obama was even elected, his thing was all health care. And it was, again, that realization that we needed to do something different in terms of the public provision of health care as a good. Um, which is very different if we compare public sentiment then to back to the Clinton administration when Hillary Clinton as Bill Clinton's wife proposed something very similar and people were really, really, really against it. But times change, right? Some 10, 15 years later after she proposed that, it was like Obama had the next best thing. Okay, so there we go. Um, Again, it's, I guess the big thing that you should get from this chapter is that it's not entirely obvious what the public sector should provide or what the private sector should provide um, for most cases. And so it really does come down to trial and error, more of an art than a science of what the government's going to provide and balancing that against um, what the private sector can sometimes provide better or at least at a cheaper cost.